Thank you all for coming. Can you hear me in the back? Great. All right, let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful. Kindle them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. God who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Our Lady, Mother of the Eucharist, pray for us. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sorry, this is saying low battery. That's, don't worry, okay. All right. Um, sorry about last month, those of you. How many um, came last month? Well, a lot of you, I'm sorry about that. Um, um, so I had COVID um, and I was somewhat feverish. I hope it wasn't totally incoherent. Um, but how many, so how many weren't here then and didn't get the first talk? So I'm in the beginning, since that's a lot of you, let me, I'm going to give a little summary of what we did last time. Um, so last, in the first talk, that we posed the question last month, um, why did Jesus institute the Eucharist? And we said that, or I said that, um, in order to answer that, we have to put ourselves in the mind of Jesus, right? And Jesus became man to be our bridegroom. Right? To, um, and we are his bride. And the Eucharist has to be understood in that context um, of the love of the bridegroom. And um, by the way, just to, so I was reading this morning, and this is a little parentheses, and Pope Francis just came out with a document on the liturgy called um, Desiderio Desideravi, sorry, Latin, which means um, with great desire, or I have earnestly desired. And it's from Luke's account of the Last Supper. Luke introduces the Last Supper um, with these words of Jesus, I have greatly desired. In English, we can't quite do this. But in Hebrew, if you want to really emphasize something, you double the verb. I have with great desire, I have desired. And the point is, Jesus instituted the Last Supper out of a great, great desire, which is a desire of love. He's the bridegroom, we're the bride, and the Eucharist is his gift to us. Right? And so we said to understand the Eucharist, um, it's helpful to think about spousal love. Right? And spousal love has these three aspects that spouses dwell together. Right? They, we share life with our and spouse. So Jesus um, instituted the Eucharist to continue to dwell with us, even though he left this earth visibly in the ascension. Right? He was going to leave it the next day in death. He knew he would rise. He knew he would ascend, though. And, um, and so he instituted the Eucharist to continue to dwell with us. And so he's actually dwelling right above us. Right? The tabernacles, I suppose, right up, more or less above this screen. Um, upstairs. Right? Um, secondly, um, spousal love involves sacrifice. Right? So spouses sacrifice themselves for their spouses and their family. Right? And that in after Eden, out of Eden, that's a gigantic part of marriage. Um, sacrificial love. And so Jesus into the Eucharist um, to perpetuate the sacrifice that he made for us on Calvary and allow us to join into it and to offer it. And we're going to talk at length about this in, I think it's the seventh or eighth talk down the so about six months um, down the road. And um, there'll be um, several talks on the Mass as sacrifice. And then the third reason is, well, spouses give themselves to one another. And there's an order there, right? We have to sacrifice our own, right? our own selfishness, our own desires, our own um, ease um, for the other. Um, and that makes possible a full self-gift. Right? So spouses give themselves to one another. Right? And so Jesus instituted the Eucharist to, so that he could give himself totally to each of us as our spiritual nourishment, to nourish us with his divine life. Right? And that's Holy Communion. And so these three purposes correspond to three mysteries that are contained in the Eucharist. 
the mystery of the real presence, right? Our, Jesus dwelling with us upstairs, and sacrificial love. Jesus and giving us the, the sacrifice of the Mass, right? So the mystery of the Mass as sacrifice. And then third, the mystery of Holy Communion. Right? So this is, that's the five-minute version of last month's talk. Okay? And, and these three um, reasons for the Eucharist are also three reasons um, for which Jesus became man. Right? So God became man. Why? So he could share our life, right? In the Old Testament, he, God presented himself as the bridegroom of Israel. But when you have a bridegroom who is divine and not human, it's kind of hard for a human bride uh, to enter into relationship with one who doesn't share our nature. Right? So what did God do? He took our nature, becoming man, so as to give us a share of his nature. Right? So that's the end. So he came to dwell with us. But we know he also came on earth to die for us, for the forgiveness of sins. And third, he, gave him, he became man um, to give himself to us, to divinize us. And so um, the reasons for the Eucharist are the same as the reasons that God became man in the first place. In other words, the Eucharist continues the logic of love that led God to share our life becoming man 2,000 years ago, right? And to make it possible for us to come into contact with him, right? Because he left this earth with his visible body 2,000 years ago, and he lived only one part of the earth, and we live here in St. Louis, and, and so the Eucharist enables us to encounter him, to join in his sacrifice, and to receive him into our bodies and souls. All right, so that's the. So given that, it makes sense. So given the fact that the Eucharist is not something marginal, um, but it stands at the very center of Jesus's becoming man in the first place, um, it makes sense that he would have prepared it well, right? In other words, if something's really important, like take a wedding, right? You don't just improvise the night before, but you plan it. Um, and maybe, yes, sometimes we go overboard with that. But, um, but this wasn't an ordinary wedding. This was the wedding of God made man with mankind. And so the Last Supper was something that Jesus prepared, that the Trinity prepared from the beginning of creation. And that may seem like a strong statement, but I hope to demonstrate that in this talk, right? So that's the purpose of this talk, is to show how God prepared for the Eucharist above all in Israel, so for 2,000 years in the life of Israel. But even before that, in the Garden of Eden. Right? Pope Francis, in that letter I just mentioned that came out two weeks ago um, on, on the liturgy, with the, I have earnestly desired, um, he um, speaks about the Last Supper, and he says this, quote, no one um, had earned a place, I'm sorry, this is not what I wanted to read, he said this, and Peter and John were sent to make preparations to eat that Passover, right? So this is in the, all the three synoptic Gospels uh, on, on the day of the last, before the, the afternoon of the day that um, he would institute the Eucharist, the disciples came to Jesus and said, where should we prepare the Passover? Right? And Jesus said, well, go into the town and you find someone carrying water on their head. Some, right? And and you can see from that several things, right? That's a weird, weird detail. But it shows us several things. It shows us one thing, that Jesus had already prepared this. The apostles hadn't prepared anything. But Jesus already had prepared an upper room, a family that was going to donate this. He had arranged with his providence that this man would be carrying water. Um, and it also shows that Jesus didn't want to be, um, this to be known where he was going to celebrate the Last Supper. And the reason for that is because Judas was looking to betray him. And Jesus didn't want to be interrupted at the Last Supper. He wanted to be captured later, after he had done something incredibly important, and that was celebrating the Last Supper and instituting the Eucharist. All right. Sorry, it's all parentheses. So Peter and John were sent to prepare for that Passover. But Pope Francis says, in actual fact, all of creation, all of history, 
was a huge preparation for that supper. God had been preparing for the Last Supper from the beginning. Right? Because the Eucharist is at the center of his plans for us. Okay? All right, that's a strong statement, but I think totally right. And so what we're going to do here is we'll look at the different figures of the Eucharist in the Old Testament, and we'll divide them according to those three purposes of the Eucharist. So dwelling with us is the first, sacrifice the second, and then union or communion the third. All right, so let's start with those figures of the presence. All right, well, the first type of, of the Eucharist is in the Garden of Eden. So in the Garden of Eden, God walked with Adam and Eve, right? And we see that, above all, um, after, um, after the sin, Adam and Eve hid. They hid precisely when they knew, um, when, when they would have walked with God in the cool of the day. Right? And that, um, so God hadn't yet become incarnate. It was not, um, um, it would have been a spiritual presence of God, but nevertheless, using this detail, that's what lovers do, right? They walk together at dusk. Right? And so Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. So there was a presence, a divine presence, mysterious, of God in Eden. Right? And there was also the tree of life. And I'll come back to that at the end. Right? So the, um, the Garden of Eden was a place with the divine presence. And in fact, that was the tragedy of the fall, is that Adam and Eve got expelled from this place of intimacy with God. Now, we tend to think of the fall as a tragedy for other reasons, right? We think that the fall is a tragedy because as a result of it, we've all got to die. And that's true. That's a tragedy also for that reason. And because of the fall, we get sick, right? And there's cancer and other things like that, and COVID. But um, that's not the... That's not the principal reason why it was a bad, a tragic thing that the original sin happened. The principal tragedy was being expelled from the place of friendship with God. Right? And that walking with God represents being in a state of grace and having charity or friendship with God. All right, that's what got lost. And we, we do get it back, right? We get it back in baptism, that share in the divine life. But... Um, yeah, so we could say salvation history was um, God's gradual restoring of what Adam and Eve had from the beginning. I had an intimate um, walking with God in the garden. All right, so I'm going to skip um, a long time, and um, let's skip to the burning bush. So for, for many millennia, we don't know how long... Um, in the past, the Garden of Eden was a long time ago, right? Our first parents. And so from that time until Abraham, the calling of Abraham, mankind was without a particular presence of God on the earth. Um, but um, the glory, one of the glories of Israel and Israel's covenant with God was an intimate presence of God in their midst. And there's a, a name for this in Hebrew, the Shekinah. Yeah. And it comes from the Hebrew word to dwell, Shachan, which is, so the Israelites were nomadic peoples at first, right? So they, they lived in tents. And, and that's in the Exodus, right? They were in tents in um, the Sinai Desert. Um, and so God dwelt in their midst also in a tent, right? It was the tent of meeting um, that God told Moses to, to build. Um, and so that's where this word comes from, Shekinah, the indwelling presence of God. And we see it first in, um, um, in Mount Sinai itself. So when they get, they, they go um, cross through the Red Sea, right? They, three months, they um, wander in the desert till they get to Mount Sinai. Um, not three months, uh, 50 days. 50 days they wander in the desert till they get to the, the foot of Mount Sinai. And that's where God establishes the Mosaic Covenant. And the whole Mount Sinai, the, the top of it, was in a cloud, right? And there was thunder and trumpet sounds, and it was very mysterious. And that um, is the glory cloud, right? A cloud that 
um, conceals, but also makes known the mysterious presence of God. Right? And it was, um, even before that, also foreshadowed in the, um, in the burning bush. So Moses' encounter with God in the burning bush was also a kind of presence of God in a particular place. In fact, the same place, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Um, and um, and on, on the, Moses, on the mountain, he was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights in that cloud, and God gave him various instructions about the covenant. And a large part of those instructions had to do with Moses um, building things, right? And what he had to build was the Ark of the Covenant and then the tent of meeting in which the Ark of the Covenant would be. And so the Ark of the Covenant um, is itself a type of Christ. So the Ark of the Covenant, it was something material, right? Made out of um, uh, a special kind of imperishable wood um, that contained three things. It contained the tablets of the law, right? So the Ten Commandments. It contained the jar of the manna. And I'll come back to the manna at the end of the talk. The, um, the bread from heaven that God nourished them with in the desert. So when they finished the, when they um, entered into the promised land, the manna stopped being given and they put the last jar of it into the Ark of the Covenant. And then in the Ark of the Covenant, there was also a rod, the rod of Aaron, so which a, um, a stick that um, blossomed miraculously to show that Aaron and his family had been given the priesthood in Israel. Right? So these three things are three types of Jesus. He's the living law or Torah. He is the bread of life, right, represented by the manna, and he's our eternal high priest of a, a better kind of priesthood than that of Aaron. Right, so the Ark of the Covenant is representing Jesus. Um, Jesus as um, the living law, the bread of life, and our high priest. Okay, that Ark of the Covenant was then put in the tent of meeting, and God um, dwelt there um, and made that known by uh, the glory cloud that descended on the, um, the tent of meeting. And we see this and God speaking, telling Moses about his presence there in Exodus 25. He says, let them make me a sanctuary. Right, so that, um, that would be the, um, the tent of meeting. That I may dwell in their midst. According to all that I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle, etc., you shall make it. And there was a mercy seat on top of the ark. And there were two cherubim on either side. And, and he says, I will speak with you of all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. There was a special place. Now, God is, um, this is before the incarnation, right? So God is not, doesn't have a body. God is everywhere because if he's not somewhere, um, there couldn't be anything there, right? Because God sustains everything in being. So wherever there are creatures, God has to be there keeping it in being, right? With his power, with his presence, and with his um, sight. And so that's true everywhere. But he promises to be in a particular place. Right? And that's, that's um, we could say that's strange. Um, but it makes sense, right? And the reason is simple. It's because we're in a place. And so God wanted to be in a place also so that he could be encountered in a human way. Does that make sense? In other words, he wanted, this was a special gift that he gave to only one people, Israel, and not to other peoples, that they could encounter him in a place. Only one place, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was. Right? So that's what he says, I will dwell in your midst. So this was one of the great glories of Israel that wasn't given to any of the other peoples. Right? So the Babylonians didn't have a special, I mean, maybe the different pagan religions thought they did, right? They were idols though, right? So every people made themselves an idol in which they thought they had a divine presence. But God said, no, those are just man-made things. But here, I'm dwelling not in an idol. It's not a, he's not dwelling in a statue. He's dwelling in this basically empty place of the tent of meeting um, with a presence in which he could be encountered. Right? And he wanted to be encountered because we're in place. And it's fitting for us to seek out God in a particular place. You can see where all of this is going, right? Um, he wants to be encountered in a human way. And this is why he became man. Right? Much, so all of this was 
um, a kind of prefiguring that he would become man and dwell in our midst, right? But he left this earth with, visibly with his ascension, and he wants to continue to be encountered, right? So you can see that this dwelling in the midst of Israel was a figure of the Eucharist that we have here. But there's a huge difference, right? In Israel, this was just one place. And you had to go to that place. And one of the things that God told Moses was to establish three pilgrimage feasts so that the Israelites had to go to the place of the sanctuary where the, his special presence was three times a year for Passover, for Pentecost, and for the Feast of Booths in the fall. Right? Okay, there are lots of other... So I, maybe I've given you too many quotes here. But a, a, another one is in Exodus 40. So after Moses actually made the Ark of the Covenant and the tent of meeting and put the Ark of the Covenant in the tent of meeting, a cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Right? So that's what I meant by the, the glory cloud. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud abode upon him and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up, the people would go on. But if the cloud rested, they would know to stay. In other words, God guided them during those 40 years that they stayed in the desert. And the cloud led them, right? So that's very interesting. That's also a type, right? That we should seek out the will of God um, in prayer, but in a particular way in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, right? He guides us interiorly, right? But we have to pray and ask um, and listen to him. And so this was a great glory of Israel, and God reminded Israel of that. He says, you shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell, for I, the Lord, dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. And so that was, you could say, Israel's greatest glory. And this is why Jews care so much about the land of Israel. Right? It's, not, it's not just a, um, a battle over real estate. It's, it was the land in which God dwelt in a special way, right? in a particular way, the Temple Mount, right? where later, we'll get to that in just a second. And in Deuteronomy 4, 7, God says to Moses, and God says through Moses, what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon it? Right? Again, that, that being able to um, speak to him in a place, even though the whole um, universe can't contain him. All right, there was a, there's a whole history of what happened to the ark after that. It was um, taken um, into Israel by um, the, um, when Joshua conquered the, um, the promised land, right? The ark led the way, as it were. The priests took the ark across the Jordan, and the waters parted like they had at the Red Sea. And so the ark of the covenant was taken into Israel, but it was captured at a certain point, right? And this is in the book of Samuel. It was um, a time in which the, the sons of Samuel were um, doing um, evil things. They were the, the high priests. And um, God allowed the Ark of the Covenant to be captured by the Philistines, stayed there, but the, and they put it in one of their temples, and their, um, their own idols uh, crashed, and, um, and the people got the plague. And so they, the Philistines got rid of the Ark, and they just deposited it in Israelite territory, and David ended up taking it to Jerusalem. But, and he wanted to build the temple, but God said through the prophet Nathan, no, that David had blood on his hands and it, he couldn't build the temple, but that his son would build the temple. Right? And that's referring to Solomon. It's also a figure, though, of a, another more distant son, Jesus, who builds the real temple, whose body is the real temple, which is, again, in the tabernacle right above us. Okay, so Solomon builds the temple. And when Solomon um, brings the, um, the Ark of the Covenant into the temple... Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests couldn't enter because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. Right. So again, the glory cloud. Now that wasn't always seen, but it was seen on these um, certain occasions. Right? All of that was a type, a figure of what we have in the Eucharist. What we have is we could say infinitely better than what Israel had. No offense to Israel. It's just simply that in, in the glory, the glory cloud was a cloud. And the Ark of the Covenant had some dead things. It had um, 
tablets of the law. It had the mana and a rod. And, and then at the um, Babylonian exile, the Ark of the Covenant was actually lost and never found. It was hidden by Jeremiah and never found. So the, the temple that was rebuilt, the second temple, just simply in the, sanction, in the Holy of Holies, it was empty. There was nothing there. Um, and so the, the Ark of the Covenant isn't, isn't really um, God dwelling in our midst substantially. That happens only when God becomes man. Right? When God becomes man, he's now taken a body, a human body, right? That's Jesus' body, first in Mary's womb for nine months and then walking through Galilee and, and Jerusalem. And that's God in the flesh. And because he's in the flesh, he's in a place, right? So during G the 33 years of Jesus' public ministry, he w God could be found in a place, literally, fully. But we know he... Uh, he was crucified, he rose, but he left with his visible presence 40 days later at the ascension. But he still wants to be encountered in a place, right? And that's, that place is wherever there is a tabernacle with the Eucharist. And so notice the increase of um, the divine generosity. What in Israel was only a figure, a beautiful, glorious figure, in, in our churches is a reality. It's the reality of, we've got here, Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the whole of Jesus. And he's wherever his bride is. Right? Whereas in Israel, there was just one place. If you lived, let's say the Holy Family lived in Nazareth, right? So on the Passover, they had to make a three or four day journey right? to, to go visit, even though there Jesus was the, the real presence of the Lord. Nevertheless, the Holy Family went to Jerusalem and worshiped him in the temple where there was just a figure of his presence, and they had to make a long journey, right? Three times a year, every year. And if you lived out of the Holy Land, many Jews at that time, at the time of Jesus, lived in other parts of the Roman Empire. And so it would be maybe a journey you could only make once in a lifetime, right? And so this can be an, a good examination of conscience for us. All right, I've got Jesus right here. How often do I come and visit him? Yeah. Okay, the type... So it's interesting, again, the reality is so much more and generous than the type, but the type in Israel had more outward glory, right? The temple in Israel was, all right, our chapel is pretty spectacular up above us, but many parish churches are not so glorious as Solomon's temple, understatement. Um, but we've got the real thing, right? In other words, we've got God made flesh in our tabernacle. Okay, part two. Let's look now at how God um, prefigured the aspect of sacrifice. And this is even more abundant. So all the sacrifices of Israel were preparations or figures of the Eucharist. The Israelites didn't fully realize that, but, but in hindsight, we can see that. Yeah. And not only in Israel, but in the whole world, because in just about every culture, um, in human history, except for modern culture, and there, um, there are priests and sacrifices offered to God by priests. And so just about anywhere, um, anywhere you look where there are human bones that can be found, we can find evidence of um, religious worship and altars. I, w I studied in the Holy Land for a year, and we took um, little biblical archaeology trips and one of, my, one of the most interesting was a trip to the city of Jericho, right? the city that Joshua destroyed when he went around it with the, the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and that um, archaeologist thing, it's one of the oldest cities on earth. So they've done an archaeological dig. Um, the ancient city, I'm sorry, this is all the princes. Ancient cities are like mounds. So if you go there, you can see there's an ancient city there because it's like a landfill. It's, it's higher than the surrounding ground because the city got destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed, rebuilt, and each time getting a little higher. Um, and so to get to the lowest level, you dig, dig like an elevator shaft. And um, so in Jericho, they dumb, dug this kind of shaft going down, and the lowest level was, they dated about 7,000 B.C. And what did they happen to find? All right, this is just coincidence. But they happened to find at the lowest level an altar. I mean, there were tons of altars in the ancient world. That's the point, is that wherever you find human bones and human remains in human cities, you find altars 
in which um, human beings offered sacrifice to God. And yes, in those sacrifices, there was very often, um, there were elements that um, didn't reflect God's plan, right? Like human sacrifice, um, sacrifice offered to idols, etc. But nevertheless, sacrifice, um, and I'll talk more about this in a future talk, is part, sacrifice is something that, in fact, um, human beings ought to offer to God. And the reason for that is because um, God is worthy of honor. And right reason ought to reflect that if I honor, say, our country, right, a few, last week, 4th of July, and we honored our independence, and that's a really good thing. And if we honor, say, president, or um, in earlier in cultures where there are kings, you honor the king, how much more sense it makes to honor the king of kings, God. And one of the ways that people honored him, um, well, the principal way in which he has been honored in human history um, is by sacrifice. And um, it's, religion has two fundamental acts, we could say. There's the interior and there's the exterior. And they need to go together. The interior act is prayer. Right? But the exterior act is offering something to God exteriorly as a sign of the interior offering of our heart. And the reason why that's a good thing to do um, and even in some way part of natural law to do that is because we're social and bodily beings. And um, each of, so during, during COVID year, when we couldn't go to church, um, we had a, um, a God corner in, in, in the basement. So I, a little crucifix and a little kneeler, um, Bible, um, and a place where we can direct prayer to God if we can't go to church. But the problem with that is that's just a private thing, right? And we're social beings. And so God has actually made us to offer him honor together and not just privately. And he wants us to offer something to him in a visible way such that we could do it together. And that would be um, something that we could see and participate in um, with our senses. All right, so this is why the cultures of the earth offered sacrifice to God. And they didn't just offer anything. They offered what sustains human life as a sign that God sustains us, giving us life. And so we give back a tiny part of what he's given us as a sign of thanksgiving, right? adoration, and also reparation or satisfaction for sin. Right, so these are the, we'll talk more about this in a future talk, but these are the reasons why in the different cultures of the world you always find um, sacrifice. And all of these sacrifices are pointing to the one perfect sacrifice, which is that of Christ. And so this is from Thomas Aquinas. The chief sacrifice of all human history is the sacrifice of Calvary. But it was being prefigured in all of the sacrifices of the pagan religions of the world and in a better way, the sacrifices that God himself commanded to be offered in Israel. Okay. And we see this from the beginning of history. So I, Jericho, that's 7,000 years ago, but before Jericho, there's the story of Noah. Right? And so Noah, what's the first thing Noah does when, he, um, when the, the rain stops right, and he gets out of the ark? First thing he does is offer sacrifice to God, right? And this is why God told him to bring um, not just two of each kind, but of the clean animals to bring seven. Right? So I don't know if you remember that detail. He was to get a couple of every type of animal so that the animals would be preserved. But certain, the clean animals, that is the animals that were clean for sacri to be offered in sacrifice, and Noah was told to bring seven of those, right? And so the first thing he does is builds an altar to the Lord, takes of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing order, he said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. All right, it's an anthropomorphic um, way of stating it. But what it's showing is something universal that we find in all human cultures, that um, sacrifice is offered and it has two directions. Its first direction is, we could say, ascending. Noah offers this up to the Lord as a sign, above all here, of thanksgiving. 
but also of reparation for sin, because the re what was the reason for the flood? The sin of mankind. And so he's offering this sacrifice. We could say there are ultimately four reasons to offer sacrifice. Um, to adore God, first and foremost. To thank him for everything that he's given us. So in this case, right, the end of the flood. Um, to um, make satisfaction for sin. And then simply to ask um, for all our needs. Right? And there's that handy acronym, ACTS. Adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. And those are the four purposes of prayer in general and of sacrifice as well. Okay. All right, so Noah offers this, and so what happens? God blesses the earth and promises never to send another flood like that one. Right? And so that's the descending blessing. So that's the logic of sacrifice. We offer something to be a sign of those four things, adoration, thanksgiving, and contrition, and um, petition or, or supplication, and then we receive his blessing. And the blessing, though, doesn't come magically or automatically, right? It's not as if um, I offer something by rote and God blesses. No, it's got to be from the heart, right? Because what God is looking at is, above all, the interior offering that the exterior offering is representing. All right, so, and then, so that's the earliest we find in the Bible. Well, actually, that's not so. The earliest is, is Abel, right? Cain and Abel, the first, and the children of Adam and Eve um, offer sacrifice, right? And that becomes the occasion of Cain murdering Abel because Abel's sacrifice was um, acceptable to God. Again, probably because of the interior offering. The sacrifice of Isaac is another great illustration. Now, again, God doesn't want human sacrifice. But he, um, he asked Abraham to make this sacrifice um, for a very particular purpose. He wanted, um, it was a kind of test. He wanted to, Abraham, he wanted to give an occasion for Abraham to merit God's blessings. Right? And so he asked Abraham to offer not just any son, right, but the son of the promise. So remember, Abraham and Sarah, Sarah was barren. They had no children. Um, God promised them a son, waited 25 years. They had to wait before they were actually got a son, Isaac, from Sarah. They tried to take matters in their own hands. That was Ishmael with, um, with a handmaid. Um, but um, this very son that they had to wait so long for, who was the son of the promise, and not just any promise, but it was the promise that God made to Abraham that in your seed, right, they will, I will make a great nation. That's the nation of Israel. It's through Isaac. But not only that, in your seed, that is in your descendants, all nations will be blessed. And that was a prophecy of Christ, right? He's the son of Abraham in whom we and all nations are blessed. And so Isaac was pretty important, right? Isaac was the, the, the son of that promise um, on whom the whole right, promise de depended. And yet God asks Abraham to offer that very son. Of course, God doesn't want him to go through with it, right? But he wants him to get as far as being on the point of offering it, right? So that he could have the merit of faith and, and trust. And so at the last minute, right, God stops him and, and he provides a sacrifice, which is the ram found in, the, right, in, the, in that place. And, and so the name of, and by the way, according to Jewish tradition, that very place where this happened is the Temple Mount. Um, it's called Mount Moriah right, in, in Genesis. And in Jewish tradition, that's the same as Mount Zion, the Temple Mount. And so that was a marvelous figure of Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary, right? Because here you had Abraham, who is a figure of God the Father. God the Father. Um, but the, the difference was that God the Father permitted the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, right? Whereas God stopped Abraham from realizing it. And then Isaac being a type of Jesus. Right? And he actually carries the wood. Right? Isaac carries the wood up to the place of sacrifice as Jesus carried the cross. So it's a beautiful um, type, um, but it's just a type. And so um, something pointing to Calvary, but pointing to the Mass as well, right? Because in every Mass we have that same sacrifice of Calvary made present here.
we've got the same Jesus on the altar and the same intention because we have the same priest. And so the Lord provides. And then there, in the so let's look now at the sacrifice of Israel that God commanded. So in the books of um, five books of Moses, in particular Leviticus, but also Numbers, and there's our and much of the so we often don't read them because they're long descriptions of the sacrifices that Israel was called to offer, right? And we don't do those sacrifices anymore, and so we tend to, at least I tend to skip those passages. But they're actually very interesting, right? Because it should, they sh all of them are prefiguring both Calvary and the Mass as sacrifice. And so there are tons of them. So every day in Israel, there was an offering, morning and evening, of a lamb. Right? So that was in the temple, not just the Passover, but every single day. And on the um, Sabbath, it was doubled. And then on other feasts, they were multiplied. And many different um, um, sacrifices were done on, say, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Pentecost, um, and above all, the Passover we'll see in a minute. And in addition to offering a lamb, there was also an offering of bread and wine in the temple every morning and evening. Right? And again, all of that prefiguring the Mass, right? The very bread and wine that Jesus used at the Last Supper and prefigured in the offering of bread and wine every day in the temple. The principal part of these sacrifices was the blood, right? And the reason for that is blood represents life, right? The life blood, we say. And so since God is the author of life, um, blood was reserved for God. And so that's why blood was a special, was set apart for God. And so the people of Israel weren't allowed to have, say, blood sausage or things like that. Um, and, and animals have to be properly um, slaughtered so that all the blood goes out, is poured out on the ground for God. Um, so that's his portion. Um, and it, so it's a sign of life and also of, um, so one offers to God what, the life, because he's the life giver. Right? The blood, for us, maybe we might think it represents death, but it's really exactly the opposite. And there were different kinds of offerings. Some of the offerings were, were burnt up entirely, and those were called burnt offerings, or holocausts, right? So a holocaust is an offering that's entirely consumed, and so it's all for God. But most of the other sacrifices, um, Parts were given just to God, and that would be the innards. Um, God liked the fat parts. Sorry. Um, th so that was for God, right? The, the gizzards and things like that. But um, the, um, the meat was um, actually eaten as a communion sacrifice by the priests and by the people as well, depending on the kind of sacrifice that it was. So sin offerings, the meat was eaten by the priests. That's how the priests lived, by the way, right? They, they lived on these... Um, on the sacrifices um, and on donations and, um, and tithing. And, um, and in the free will offerings, the people who offered it also um, consumed it. And we're going to come back to this later. This is why in the Mass, the sacrifice and communion naturally go together. That's how it was in Israel. You sacrificed first, and then, um, according to the kind of sacrifice it was, you would consume the very animal that you had just offered. All right? And the reason for that, it was a sign, it's like sharing some, and we do that ourselves, right? When we share a meal with someone, if we take someone into our house and share a meal, that creates a special bond, right? It's the bond of hospitality. And that should be, especially in ancient cultures, that was seen to be a sacred bond, right? You shared a meal together, right? That's what we do, families at Thanksgiving. And so this is sharing a meal with whom? With God, right? That's the idea, right? The animal is offered to God, and yet we consume a part of it as a sign of, um, of blood relations, as it were, with God himself, except he got all the blood. And, and uh, that to, we'll talk about this next, um, next month when we look at the Last Supper and how Jesus did the, the shocking thing at the Last Supper, right, was telling the apostles to drink the blood, right? his blood, because that had been reserved for God. Right? And so that's a sign, again, if even more we're being um, brought into union with God. Right? That's the, the meaning of it. Okay. Um, 
And so all of these sacrifices of Israel were signs, we could say, of Calvary and the Mass. And, and, and there were t um, one special one was at the, um, at the foot of Mount Sinai, the sealing of the covenant. Right? So the, the old covenant was sealed with the blood of 12 bulls. Right? So 12 bulls to represent the 12 tribes. They sacrificed the bulls and they poured out the, um, the blood, half of it on the altar, half of it sprinkled on the people. Again, the same idea, showing a kinship now established between Israel and God. That's what we mean by covenant, right? a, a, a communion. So that was pointing forward to the Last Supper in which the blood isn't simply sprinkled on us, but given to us to, to drink and not the blood of bulls. Right, but the blood of God made man. Okay. All right. The, um, of all the different sacrifices of Israel, the most important was the Passover. Um, and it, that, this is the reason why Jesus chose the Passover to institute the Eucharist. Right? Not by chance. Um, and it's also the, um, we, we don't see this today, but it would have been the bloodiest at the time of um, when the temples, so the Passover is still celebrated by Jews today, but not with a sacrifice. And the reason for this is that in Israel, all the sacrifices had to be offered in one place only, the temple, the place where there was God's indwelling presence in the um, Holy of Holies. And so there was an altar right outside um, um, where all the sacrifices of Israel had to be offered. And that's why we've been hearing in the readings, the sin of Samaria, because they built the other altars on, in Samaria, right? That God hadn't commanded. Um, and that was the sin of Samaria. Um, in any case, so they, um, sin, oh, the temple got destroyed 70 AD, 19 centuries ago. And this is why Jews don't sacrifice um, a Paschal lamb anymore, because there's no temple in which to sacrifice it. Um, but when the temple still stood, every household had to come to Jerusalem. So you could only do this in Jerusalem because you had to bring the lamb to be sacrificed. And the only place was Jerusalem. And so every family group, say a group of, say, 20, think of a Thanksgiving kind of household, um, would bring a lamb with them. And that lamb would be sacrificed in the afternoon um, just before the Last Supper. Right? And that's when the, the apostles asked Jesus, you know, where, where should we go to, to prepare the... Um, so they would have had a lamb, presumably gone to the temple, had it sacrificed. The blood was poured out on the altar, and then the lamb was taken home and roasted. Right? And every family had to roast it and consume it that night. Now, if every group of, say, if every household had to do this, and everybody had to come to Jerusalem on the same day to do this, imagine all, all of us doing Thanksgiving dinner, let's say, in the whole country, together in one city, or in, let's, I don't know, in Shrewsbury. Um, that's a, a lot of lambs being brought to this one place. I mean, I don't know how many it would have been, but at the time of Jesus, it could well have been 10, 20,000. And so the priests were really busy that afternoon, cutting the throats and taking the blood and pouring it on the altar. This would have made a huge impression, right? And this would have been, a, a, I mean, a spectacle showing the importance of sacrifice. Right? 10,000 lambs being offered. And yet, it having to be repeated each year because none of them was the perfect sacrifice. Right? All of them were figures pointing to the one perfect sacrifice, Calvary and the Mass. And another interesting thing about the Passover is, yeah, well, I'll come back to that later. Um, so the Passover is the perfect um, uh, figure. And of course, Jesus um, is the Passover, right? That's how John the Baptist identifies him. This, behold the Lamb of God, right? That would be understood the Paschal Lamb. Pope Francis, in this letter to, that he published two weeks ago, um, speaks again. Jesus knows that he is the lamb of that Passover meal. He knows that he is the Passover. Okay. All right, I'm going to skip a bit. Third um, aspect of the Mass is um, union, communion. Right? And we said all of the sacrifices have this aspect as well, right? The Passover, because the people didn't just offer the lamb in sacrifice, they consumed the same lamb that they had just offered, right? The blood was for God alone, but the meat was eaten by the family, right? And so that's an aspect of um, prefiguring this third aspect of the Eucharist, Holy Communion, which is a kind of spiritual nourishment, right? In the Eucharist, 
We are fed by God himself, God made man. He feeds us with his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Right? So this too was prefigured in Israel, prefigured by all those sacrifices, but also in a special way by the manna in the desert. Um, and so this is um, probably familiar because we hear about this in the, in the liturgy. Um, and so um, in the desert, there was no food, and God, the people rumbled and complained, right? And so God um, sent them bread from heaven, which really was not, um, it wasn't the Eucharist, it was, it was just bread, but bread that was miraculous in origin, right? It wasn't the fruit of human effort, right? It was a bread that God gave them. Um, and um, there are many things that um, point to the Eucharist. Even the name itself, manna means, does anybody know? What's that? Right? It's the Hebrew word for what's that? And because it was something totally new that they didn't know. And that, that prefigures the Eucharist, right? The Eucharist is beyond any explanation. I'm going to give an attempt in talk, I forget if it's five or six, a few months from now, we'll talk about transubstantiation. And I'd probably get some um, glazed looks, um, perhaps. But um, the point being, the Eucharist is, transcends, is beyond any, um, beyond our understanding. Right? It's the mystery of mysteries. Well, the manna, what's that, was already prefiguring that. And then, um, again, it came from above, not from below. It wasn't the work of human hands. The Eucharist isn't something we give ourselves. Right? It's, it's Jesus' own life given to us from above. And then each person, um, there was a sweetness to the Eucharist. Um, Right, so, it managed, so we see in the Old Testament that the Eucharist had a sweetness for those who were rightly disposed. But for those who weren't well disposed, right, it was too plain. They, they longed for the flesh pots of Egypt. So again, that was prefiguring. So it's a great blessing when we have, are given by the Lord a great desire to receive him in the Eucharist. Right? And, it, and we receive it with a sweetness. Right? That's a gift of God. Um, but if we're not well disposed, right? I mean, people prefer other things. Yeah. But the psalm says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Then another thing about it was that the mana, it didn't matter how much you gathered, right? You got just the right amount. And it's the same with the Eucharist, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter how many hosts we receive. We receive the same one Jesus. And then everyone, so we all receive the same Jesus in Holy Communion. But we don't all receive the same grace. And I'll talk more about this in a much later talk on Holy Communion. That each of us receives a grace proper to our heart. And proper to the desire and love we bring. We all receive the same Jesus. But some get sanctified more than others because they're hungering and thirsting more. Right? So like with the, the manna. And even, um, so the fact that the jar of manna was kept in the Ark of the Covenant, right? even that's prefiguring Eucharistic adoration. I'm sorry, I know I have to, I'm running out of time here. But um, another interesting figure of the Eucharist was the bread of the presence. It's easy to miss this, not as prominent in the lectionary as the manna. But in the temple, um, the priest laid out before the Lord 12 loaves of bread to signify the 12 tribes. And um, they're called the bread of the face, literally, right? which seems strange. But the face is an expression for the presence of God. And so that would have been loaves set before the presence of God um, in the sanctuary. And you're probably familiar with the story where David was um, fleeing from Saul and um, was hungry. And um, he was at the sanctuary there, and there was no bread except for the consecrated bread of the face or bread of the presence, which the priest allowed him to eat. Right? And, that's a and that comes up in the Gospels because that's a figure of the Eucharist. And David and his men eating something reserved for the priests as a kind of sign of, in the New Covenant, that bread of life given to all. But that bread of the presence was just bread. Right? It was bread baked by the Levites but put before God, whereas we have a bread that becomes God. And there's, um, it's interesting that the, um, in the pilgrimage feasts, 
Apparently, the priests would bless the people with the bread of the presence. They would take these loaves and bless them. I don't know, probably not in the sign of a cross. But in any case, they would bless the people saying, behold God's love for you. Beautiful kind of figure of, again, Eucharistic benediction. All right, last type that I'm going to, well, two more. Um, at the Passover, in addition to the lamb, there was also uh, unleavened bread and wine, right? Four cups of wine. Um, and Jesus used precisely that, the, the unleavened bread and, and one of the cups of wine, to institute the Eucharist. Right? And that's where we get the, um, the matter for the Eucharist, being unleavened bread and, and wine. Yeah. Another figure right from the beginning that I mentioned at the beginning is the, the tree of life. So in Eden, there was the, they walked with God, but there was also a tree of which if one ate of it, one wouldn't die. Right? That's how Jesus spoke. We'll look at this next month. When, so next month, we're going to have a talk on um, the Eucharist in the New Testament, and we'll look at the bread of life discourse of Jesus in John 6. But John, um, Jesus presents the Eucharist as a new kind of tree of life. Right? He calls it, instead of tree of life, it's the bread of life. Right? So again, restoring what had been lost with the original sin, access to the tree of life. And then the, the final type that I'm going to mention is the desire of, of Israel. So Israel, and um, so many of the Psalms express the desire of, um, of the, the saints of Israel for a more intimate con uh, union with God. Right? So, for example, in Advent, we recite this line from Isaiah, oh, that you would tear the heavens and come down. Right? Well, that happened in the, in the incarnation. Right? God, that's why we read that in Advent. But it happens in every Mass. Right? In every Mass, the Lord becomes present here. Or Isaiah 55, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come buy milk, wine and milk without money, without price. So again, that's a figure or a prophecy about the Eucharist. And the saints longed for this, right? And so there's the Psalm 42, as a heart longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for thee, O God. So what in the Old Testament the saints and the faithful could only yearn for, we are given, right, in every Holy Communion. But the problem is, do we yearn for it as much as, as the Israelites yearned for it as something future? All right, I'm going to leave it there. And... Um, and I think there's time for questions. And I'm happy to stay as long as anybody would like questions. So, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for the gift of the Eucharist and for having prefigured it so abundantly in the history of Israel and mankind through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.